So the second lecture is about understanding probabilistic programming inference. Okay, so uh, UI very kindly, where uh, where's UI? I don't see. There he is, back in the back. Very kindly said, you better you better put some more meat in. Okay, All right. These are these are these are math people. So let's let's do a little bit of meat today. Not not too much, but a little bit. Okay, because uh, to understand what's going on, it would be very helpful to to see how we perform inference. Okay, so taught you a little bit about how to program. A disappointing number of you uh, chose to actually try programming in the system. Um, uh, today we're going to talk about how the system actually does inference automatically. Um, it would have helped to do some of the programs so that you, programming so that you see how the, the code gets executed and how that, course, the, how that execution of code corresponds to the distributions that we're going to do inference over. Okay, last time we talked about uh, procedures as sampling. That's really the, the, the critical bit. And that programs are generative models. Okay. Today we're going to show how sampling execution traces is inference. Okay, so we're going to do Bayesian inference. And what we're going to actually be doing inference over are the execution traces of the probabilistic program. In other words, which paths the program can take that yield, uh, uh, that, that make the, the, the data likely to have been generated by the program. Okay, so sampling over this space of paths is how we do inference in probabilistic programming. Uh, different traces arise from the the, 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 the output of stochastic procedures. Okay? So if any point in the program you encounter a call to normal, you can think about this as the execution path of the program branching with whatever the return value of that procedure was. Yeah? Okay? So uh, there are going to be, so again, since every procedure samples, every procedure application is a potential branching point for the program. Okay, so we've got elementary random procedures, so obviously there are going to be branch points at those, like flip, normal, discrete, Poisson, lambda, so obviously flip, depending on its outcome, if you put that in an if statement, for instance, is going to actually be a branch, right, of the program in a, in a traditional sense, right? But of course, compound procedures, so this is some, some function of A and B, this also induces several uh, but potentially complex uh, branches in the execution of the program, so depending on the outcome of this flip, then, then there's an additional branch depending on whatever the value is returned from Poisson B and whatever the value is returned from normal AB, for instance. Okay? Uh, observations weight execution traces in the, in, in the, in the uh, we'll get to it, but in the, in the case, uh, in the case of, say, for instance, rejection sampling or constraints, uh, those weights are just ones and zeros, actually. Uh, but uh, more generally, observes in the, in, in the way that Anglican fronts observes uh, weight uh, execution traces. Okay, so today we're going to do a little bit of review of, of sort of Monte Carlo based inference. I think uh, Ian, did Ian give a tutorial this time? Murray? Okay, yeah, so you guys have all done MCMC in an awesome way. Ian, Ian's lectures are incredible. Uh, so I've, I'm going to go through this really, really fast. I'm going to touch on, I'm going to give <laughs> two slides on programming language interpretation. Who here has written an interpreter? Two people. OK, good. So two slides on program, uh, programming language interpretation. Uh, then we're going to talk about what a trace probability is. How do we define the probability of a trace? going to establish a correspondence of the trace to, a, uh, to a, a joint probability distribution, and that's going to be the distribution over which we do inference. And then we're going to talk about actual probabilistic program interpretation using a number of different uh, inference techniques from up here, basically all of these inference techniques up here. So when we're doing probabilistic inference, uh, we usually want to do some sort of inference task or prediction task or inspection, and these can all, generally speaking, be expressed as expectations. So if f is some, some test function that we're interested in, in knowing something about, uh, then, and p is some distribution, then if we want to get the expect expected value of f, then we can just integrate f against p, uh, against that distribution. Of course, most of the time, we can't analytically express that distribution, so we end up resorting to some sort of uh, Monte Carlo approximation to this, this integral, where what we do is we sample somehow from, uh, from, from P, big L samples, and we estimate 
the, the we compute the expected value of that of that of that, that, that function against the distribution by simply doing a, an empirical average of the function evaluated all of the sample points drawn from p. Okay, nothing nothing new or surprising here. Uh, did did Ian do uh, rejection sampling? Yeah, he did. Okay, so it's it's worth pointing out just one little twist on rejection sampling because it's it it shows up and it was actually the original church inference algorithm. Uh, <clears throat> so let's say we want to to sample from from p. Uh, uh, p is easy to ev evaluate, but only only known up to an unknown normalizing constant. And let's also assume, and this is sort of a funny situation uh, quite often, uh, it's not e necessarily always easy to, to, to do this, but let's say that we have some proposal distribution Q such that some constant K times Q is greater than this unnormalized distribution for all Z. Okay? So we're going to design such a Q, and then we're going to end up sampling from Q and, and, and rejecting. Okay? So rejection sampling. So you sample some, so what, how does rejection sampling work? You sample Z from Q instead, and you sample some uniform variate between zero and K times the, the, the function Q, the value of, of, of Q evaluated at Z. <clears throat> when you do this, basically, you get samples drawn uniformly in this, in this shaded region, right? So you're going to sample a value from from, from Q, and it's going to be somewhere under the blue shaded region, and then you sample a value U tau in this shaded region, right? So you've got a uniform samples over this shaded region. Then the rule is pretty simple. If, if you look at the value of U and you compare it to P total of, of, of Z, and <clears throat> then you can accept the sample, okay? Uh, otherwise, it's rejecting the process is repeated until uh, a sample is accepted. Accepted sort of by definition because you have a uniformly distributed samples uh, over, under the shaded region, then if you reject everything that's outside of the white region, right, everything that's left will be uniformly distributed over the white region, and if you forget the values of u, then you have samples from p twiddle z. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Uh, so the only twist here is that, uh, and this is pretty straightforward, uh, is that let's say we have some model P, uh, some variables which are known, so this, this is you know, some joint distribution, and let's say we have some subset of the joint distribution Z OMS, these are observed variables, and let's say that uh, another subset, the union of which is Z, uh, are the latent variables, and what we would like is we'd like to get samples from the latents given the observed. Okay, okay. That's of course by Bayes' rule just a joint over the uh, evidence. Um, so we can write out this conditional distribution, this, this this distribution that we're interested in, as an unnormalized distribution, the conditional distribution of the latents given the observed, by just multiplying an indicator function against the joint distribution that constrains the value of the, of the subset of observed variables to be something here, x. Okay? All right. So we can do rejection sampling in this case. So rejection sampling is, again, exactly what I talked about. So we, we can do rejection sampling by identifying our proposal distribution is actually the prior, the, the joint. Right? So if we, can, if we can propose via ancestral sampling from the joint, for instance, then we can, uh, we can use this to generate samples uh, distributed according to this conditional distribution of interest, i.e. the latents given the observed. And of course, by construction, um, this kind of Q is, is, is greater than or equal to P twiddle everywhere. Okay? Because it's either uh, uh, Q is just one or zero times P in the first place. So, uh, so how does, how does this work? So if we're going to do conditioning via rejection and, and ancestral sampling, then we can sample Z from Q, okay? But we've, we've said that Q is just the generative model, so we're just going to sample from this via ancestral sampling, excuse me. Um, then we're going to sample a uniform variate between 0 and Q, and then we're going to accept the sample only if U is less than PZ times an indicator function uh, of, of that the observed data, uh, the observed variables, the observed subset of variables in the joint is equal to some observed value X. 
Okay? So in this particular setting, a sample will only ever be accepted when the observations actually are constrained to the values of x, and then it will always be because, of course, you're actually proposing from, a condi uh, from a, an ancestral sampler. Okay? Now, it's sort of clear that unless the prior and posterior are extremely well matched, this will be an, an, a very, very inefficient sampler. But can anybody see how you would use this straight away in probabilistic programming? Just to get you thinking about probabilistic programming inference. Somebody take a, take a guess? <coughs> Okay, so the, 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 the comment down here from somebody who's seen probabilistic programming like at least 10 times because he's at, at Cambridge, and maybe it's obvious to everyone else, and he's been very nice to just point out the obvious to me, but I appreciate it anyway. Thank you very much for the comment. Uh, is, okay, well, what are you doing? Uh, well, where's the algorithm here? Okay, sorry. So if you have a program, and that program is your generative model, okay, then you can just run the program, and it's going to generate some data. Okay, that's exactly what a probabilistic program does. It generates data, right? So if you run the program, and it happens to to generate exactly the set of observations that you've imposed, i.e., equality constraints on the observations, then in fact, just running the program and checking to see whether its output matches your observes is a sampler. End of story, right? Write the program, run it, check to see whether it matches your output. Do it again, do it again, do it again. The sequence of program executions that match the output consist of a set of random variables, i.e. program traces, i.e. whatever, uh, that then you can query and ask about the posterior distribution of those variables con constrained or conditioned on observed output, okay? So we'll do that again, but that's sort of, if you get that, then you're, then you're halfway there. Okay? Program, generative model, run the generative model, check to see whether or not it matches your data exactly. How's this going to work if you have continuous observations? <coughs> so some people in the front said, nah. some people in the back are reading BuzzFeed. Um, so it's not going to work. Right? Right? Uh, so this is why we, we have soft, soft observes, okay? One slide on Metropolis Hastings, okay? So I'm, I assume that all of you are familiar with uh, Metropolis Hastings. But, uh, so Metropolis Hastings is, of course, a, a Markov chain Monte Carlo procedure for sampling from some, some distribution. And we'll just look at the algorithm today. So if we, if we initialize tau to something and we initialize z tau to be something, then if we repeat forever yielding this sequence of samples, we propose z star from some, some distribution. We accept with some rule, which compares the probability of the new setting of the random variables to the, to the old, and then has a, has a, uh, a, 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 a correction factor the Hastings ratio here to, to make sure that you can you, you get detailed balance uh, for non-symmetric proposals. Uh, so if Z star is accepted, then we in, add it to the list of samples that are generated otherwise. Uh, uh, otherwise, we just keep the value of the, of the variables the same that we're sampling, and then we incre increment T, okay? So uh, we're gonna talk, so why do I put this up here? We're gonna talk about how to do inference in the space of probabilistic programs using Metropolis Hastings, okay? So let's remember that what we need, so what do we need in order to de define a Metropolis Hastings algorithm for sampling in any particular space? Well, we need a proposal, we need a joint distribution, and that's, that's about it, okay? So I haven't told you what the joint distribution is, so you, the, the, the question in the back of your mind should be, what's the joint distribution over Z? What is the, the distribution over an execution trace? Okay? And then, what's the proposal mechanism for proposing a new trace given an old trace? Okay? So keep that in the back of your head. Okay. Last one, did, did Ian do uh, important sampling and sequential importance resampling, sequential Monte Carlo? You did? Sweet. So somebody, somebody's already done sequential Monte Carlo, so I don't have to do sequential Monte Carlo either? Nobody, nobody's done sequential Monte Carlo at the tutorial? Okay, all right, so I, spent, I have a couple more slides on this. Okay. Everybody knows who, everybody knows important sampling? Okay. 
All right, so important sampling. We have some, some, some expectation that we'd like to, to, to take with respect to some conditional distribution. Now I'm switching notation from Zs to Ys and Xs. That's fine. So the Ys here are going to be observations. The Xs are going to be latent variables. We have some test function that we'd like to integrate against the posterior distribution of the latent variables given the observations. That's going to be H here. So this integral, maybe we can't uh, evaluate P um, or even necessarily sample. Well, we can evaluate P, but we can't necessarily sample exactly from it. So what we can do is we can just introduce some, some helper function Q, this, uh, this uh, proposal distribution. And we can approximate in the standard kind of Monte Carlo way uh, this uh, integral of interest, this uh, inference task by a sum over samples drawn from Q, but where the sample, where the, where the, the where what remains is the ratio of the pointwise uh, evaluation of P and Q at those sample values, which we would call an importance weight, okay? So W is just P over Q in general, and we can approximate this kind of, uh, uh, of test integral or expectation by, via uh, an empirical average of draws from Q, where we correct for the difference between Q and P by these, by these weights, okay? <coughs> if we're in a, in, a, in a situation, in say for instance, like a state space model or something like this, where we have some sort of structure in the model that we can exploit, we, we can sort of, uh, it doesn't even have to be a state space model, but, but it won't go there. We can exploit uh, uh, importance resampling in, uh, to, to basically allow us to anneal from one distribution to the next, uh, one approximating distribution to the next via a sequence of important sampling steps. So if we have some distribution, some posterior distribution over latents x1 to n given y1 to n, which is proportional to the joint, which has this kind of Markov structure, for instance, where we have some sort of observation distribution G, where we look at, at the observed value of Y, given all of the latents up to that point, and some sort of transition distribution that allows us to generate Xn from X1 to N minus 1. Well, we can target this distribution, this conditional distribution. We can try to, to represent it using a, a, a weighted set of particles. So here we have the conditional distribution of x1 to n given y1 to n. It's the sum over L particles of the weights and delta masses at the, at the draws from that. And if we note the identity, i.e., that the conditional distribution of x1 to n is related to the conditional distribution of x1 to n minus 1, plus just an extra couple of terms, suggests that we, can, that we can use importance sampling to sample from this conditional distribution of interest um, given, the sequen given the sample based approximation to this. Okay? So I assume that many of you have seen this recursion before. I, I certainly hope so. So in other words, if we ha have this representation, this is a recursion, right? So if we have this representation for the, the uh, posterior distribution of the latents up to n minus 1, then if we identify the distribution of interest as being this, as it, as it would be, so the distribution of the latents up to, uh, up, up, up to, up to n, <coughs> and, we <coughs> and we identify proposal distribution, which is just uh, <coughs> the same thing without this, this, this likelihood term, then we can approximate the, the posterior distribution of the latents up to n, given all the observations, as just, again, a weighted set of samples where, uh, where you weight the sample by the difference between the proposal, by the ratio of the, the, the distribution of interest and the proposal distribution, which is just g here, uh, times atoms drawn from the distribution of interest, where here, x1 n l, the, 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 the sample path to observation n is just at the, uh, at a sample path uh, up fr from 1 to n minus 1 uh, continued by drawing from f. Okay, that's super fast, I know, but we, this is review. We need to get to probabilistic programming. Does it make sense? Any questions? All right. Uh, so sequential importance resampling is, is, is used, or particle filtering is used quite often in, in, in state space models. 
so let's consider doing inference in a state space model. And this is going to be related to some of the probabilistic programming uh, ideas that we'll talk about in just a second. So if we have a state space model where we have some fixed parameter theta out there upon which all of these transition and observation distributions depend. Uh, and we have a sequence of latents, x0 to xn, and a sequence of observations, y1 to yn, then we have a little bit of a, uh, we have a, little bit of a problem, which is that uh, if we fix theta, then we can use sequential importance resampling or whatever to estimate the con uh, a distribution over the x's. And if we have x's, we can, we can use, so, well, we can't use sequential Monte Carlo up here, and single site updates won't work here. Does that make sense? Questions? I think I've lost like 35% of you now, maybe 40% of you, maybe 50%. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Uh, well, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll power on because we'll get to the probabilistic programming. The, the point is, if we want to do inference in such a problem, se sequential Monte Carlo works well here. Uh, Metropolis Hastings works well here, but you can't really do sequential Monte Carlo over theta. Uh, um, and single site updates won't work here, okay? So um, what, what you would like to do if, say, for instance, inference over theta, this fixed parameter is, is, is of interest, is you might like to be able to write down an ideal Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, which moves in the space of theta by proposing theta prime uh, from some proposal distribution, and then evaluating the evidence for the observations, analytically marginalizing out all of the x's, okay? So if you want to do inference in, in this model and you want to actually, and you really care about these fixed parameters, then what you want to do is you want Metropolis Hastings, where again, you propose from, from, from some proposal distribution for theta and then can evaluate these quantities. But um, you can't actually evaluate those quantities in these kinds of models, but uh, sequential Monte Carlo provides an unbiased estimate of this quantity, which is, which is kind of interesting and uh, you can read about in Del Morrill's book if you would if you'd like. Uh, and very, very surprisingly, um, uh, you can actually plug those into a Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. Uh, so if you do Metropolis-Hastings with unbiased likelihood estimates here, then, uh, uh, and, uh, then this, is a, this is a valid uh, Metropolis-Hastings algorithm for the space of, of, of theta. And these estimates are computed via a sequential Monte Carlo or a sequential importance resampling uh, 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 proposal. So basically what this means is that we can run, we can do inference in a model like this by uh, running a particle filter, computing these uh, evidence, these unbiased evidence estimates, running another particle filter, computing an evidence uh, estimate, and uh, comparing the ratio of those for two different values of theta, and accept or reject the value of uh, a sample from theta from this, from this uh, uh, according to this rule, okay? So this is the world's fastest introduction to uh, uh, swing through uh, rejection sampling, important sampling, sequential importance resampling, Metropolis Hastings, uh, particle MCMC, uh, uh, which, of which particle marginal Metropolis Hastings is one variant, and particle Gibbs is another. Uh, in terms of general purpose inference, okay? So uh, what we're gonna do is start talking about how these things apply in the probabilistic programming context. Though I should point out that the sequential Monte Carlo methods that we've, that we've discussed require only that you can initialize, in other words, P of X1 can be sampled, that you can run, the, run forward, you can sample forward from F. So in other words, you can sample Xn given Xn, X1 to N minus one, and you can compute the observation distributions point-wise up, up to a constant multiple, okay? All right, now, how does this all apply to probabilistic programming and how are we actually doing inference in probabilistic programs, okay? So the first thing we have to do is establish some sort of correspondence between a generative program and an execution trace probability and then sort of all of this metropolis hasting stuff will hopefully fall into place. So we're, let's take a look at this piece of code. Um, so what does it do? It says assume Poisson 1 is some beta distributed random variant with parameters 7 and 4, and Poisson 2 is some, some 
compound procedure which adds one to a Poisson random draw with parameter eight. Then we have a generative model which, so these are parameters of interest, then we have a generative model part one which is some function. We've seen this function before, lambda AB. So if you flip according to A, uh, then it's either, then this function will either return seven added to a Poisson draw with parameter B or if if flip A is, is false, it will return a normal draw with uh, parameter A, uh, with mean A and, and standard deviation B. The second part of the generative models is just a, is just a thunk. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a function with no parameters that draws from a gamma distribution with uh, parameters, parameter of interest one and parameter of interest two. Uh, then there are two observations. We observe a normal variate given mean generated by this first part of the generative model, uh, standard deviation one that takes value 18, and then we, then we observe a normal distributed quantity uh, having mean zero and standard deviation generated by the second part of the generative model, calling the second part. And this, we observe, takes value six. Uh, and what we'd like to do is predict the, uh, a list of the consisting of the values of the parameters of interest. Okay, teaching example again. All right, so since there are only two people who've, who have written interpreters in the audience, this is, this is, this is going to be ugly. Not that the stuff before this wasn't. Um, uh, so understanding the correspondence between the generative model and the execution trace requires you to actually know what happens when you execute or interpret code like this. Okay? So the two slides on, on program interpretation are, if you haven't read this book, The Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, it's potentially the best book in computer science. Uh, I really, really like it. It, it formed the basis for all of MIT's undergraduate computer science uh, intro programming classes for the better part of 30 years. It's a gem. Okay. And in it, there's two pieces of, of code that if you spend a long time staring at them, you will understand basically how programs are inter interpreted and in fact how computers work really. Um, uh, it's called the metacircular evaluator and what it tells you is how to take an expression like this and actually have a computer run it. And that involves sort of a trampolining recursion between evaluation function, uh, expression evaluation and procedure applications. Okay, so this, this looks kind of nasty it's not, actually. It's, a, it's, it's unbelievably beautiful. And we talked about evaluation and application in the, in the, in the, in the first lecture, and, and this, of course, gave rise to the ability to do things like the arithmetic, and, uh, arithmetic function induction. So how do you evaluate an expression? So there's an environment thing. This is basically a model of the, of, of the computer's memory. Well. If that evaluation, let's go back, well, it can, it can either be a variable or a quoted expression or an assignment of, of a variable to something or an if statement or, or, a, or, we, or you make a procedure. But if it's, an, if it's an application, then the first thing that you do is you apply and even, so here we go, here's the, here's the, here's the beautiful sort of uh, whatever, so, 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 the first thing it does is it applies the procedure resulting from evaluating the operator of this expression. Okay? So, uh, <laughs> so then you go over to here to apply, and if apply, since if you're trying to apply a primitive procedure, then it just does whatever it returns the the the, the, the primitive procedure. But if the procedure is a compound procedure, then it actually goes in and evaluates all of the sub parentheses of that compound procedure. So evaluating a statement like this requires you to go and look up what this is. That's going to be a compound procedure. And then it descend in, into, the, into the compound procedure, evaluating each of the symbols to see whether or not it's a defined symbol or whether it's a. Uh, a procedure, applying procedures to arguments after you've evaluated the arguments and figured out what values they take. So there's this sort of uh, tree-like recursion that evaluates and applies and evaluates and applies. Okay. There's the only way to get this really is to is to 
is to go home, get the book, or look it up online, or, or spend some time staring at this. How it applies to us will be apparent after we talk about, after we really establish this correspondence. So, so I, I obviously threw state space models out there in front of you, uh, and that sort of notation. Now we get to the meat. Okay, so what's the definition of an execution trace probability, probabilistic programming? This is it. Okay, so uh, the 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 execution trace probability is the joint probability of all of the observed quantities y1 to n, and all of the randomness generated along a particular path, along the an execution at a a halting or complete execution of the program, and that's x1 to n, okay? We'll talk about what that is in just a second, okay? So that execution trace probability is just the product of all of the observations. So those are the observed statements in the program, where the observed statements are going to be notated by g, y n is the observed value, theta is the parameter of the observation distribution, Tn is the type of the observation distribution, and x1 to n is the interpreter memory state immediately before evaluating the likelihood of observation y. <coughs> okay? uh, and then f is some funny transition function that allows the interpreter to get from x1 to n minus 1, i.e., it will generate all of the necessary randomness to. Uh, uh, to evaluate this observed statement. Okay, so just to be a, a really pedantic here, so here's the, the execution trace probability, p of y, one day. So this is, this, this is the definition, okay? But what we're interested in, in general, is the conditional distribution of the internal randomness of the random variables generated in the execution of the program, given that certain observations were generated, okay? So, so we, we know that this conditional distribution is always proportional to the joint, okay? and we know that we can do Metropolis Hastings and particle MCMC and rejection sampling and that sort of stuff when we have an unnormalized distribution. So we're going to uh, basically constrain uh, uh, using the observations, i.e. those are going to be the likelihoods, the weights associated with execution traces, and we're going to we're going to generate samples from the conditional distribution by sampling from the, the, the joint, as usual. OK. So uh, what's this f function? This f function is pretty complicated in the probabilistic programming context. The f function uh, is, is basically stands in for the forward interpretation of the probabilistic program. Forward interpretation, i.e. executing everything necessary in order to get to the nth observation, generates sequences of stochastic procedure applications. Okay? And that, that, so f of xn given x1 to n minus 1 is the product of however many um, stochastic procedure applications are necessary, are encountered given whatever choices and branches and whatever the execution of the program takes of the probability of x in k, so now we have a sub-index. This is a little bit, a little bit confusing. Um, uh, so in between observation n and n minus 1, or n minus 1 and n, the interpreter is going to do a bunch of stuff. This will be clear in just a second, hopefully. Uh, uh, and all of the stuff in between, all of the random choices made in between, we're, we're going to really abuse notation and call and index those random choices in between the observations x in k. So k will count up uh, to however many it takes to get to the nth observation. And again, theta is the parameter of the, of the stochastic procedure. T in k is the type of the in k stochastic procedure. Of course, these are conditioned on all the random choices made prior to n minus 1, but also including all of the choices after observation, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, on the path to observation n up to k minus 1, okay? I'm guessing that this makes absolutely no sense yet, okay? That's fair. There's no, there's like so much stuff to try to put in, in, in the right order. It's very, very difficult. Okay, so what, what are, so let's interpret observed statements. How do we read an observed statement and how does it correspond to the math, okay? So, uh, so 
f y n theta t n x one to n. Okay, all right. The type of the the this is normal. Now, a little gotcha that you should pay attention to here <coughs> is that this is an expression, as an arbitrary expression in the in the programming language. So the type of, even the type of the random distribution can be a function of the interpreter memory state up until that point. Okay? It's just an expression. So in other words, you could flip a coin and make it normal, or you could flip a coin and make it log normal. Okay? So the type is potentially random. Okay? Uh, the observation shows up out here. Okay, so yn is going to be out here. The parameter is also an expression, or the parameter vector is also an expression. Uh, in fact, here it's a list, right, uh, consisting of, uh, of whatever the application of the generative model, the, the procedure generative model part one to the parameter of interest one or parameter of interest two and one. Okay, so let's, let's do that again. So type, observed value, Parameter. Okay, all of these are arbitrary program elements, right? They're arbitrary expressions. This has to evaluate to a to a constant. This has to evaluate to an ERP in in in, in Anglican. Okay, now the tricky part is what's x one, and if you actually care about what's going on, which, judging by. Uh, there's a, there's a few of you who do, okay? Uh, so what is x1? Well, what time do I get to go to? 10.30? Okay. What is x1? Well, let's run this program, okay? Okay, so the first line that we get to, we actually, uh, we actually do evaluate this expression, okay? So this is where we're going to do this sort of ping-ponging recursion between evaluation and application. So we're going to evaluate this expression. We're going to find out that it's a procedure. We're going to evaluate seven. We're going to find out that that's a constant. We're going to evaluate four. We're going to find out that that's a constant. Then we're going to apply the, the elementary random procedure beta to its argument seven, four, and we're going to generate a value. Okay. So this is the first branch of the execution path. Right. Let's say that x11 happens to take value of 0.4 okay? on this particular execution path. Okay? So now we get to the second statement. Uh, so this is now a compound procedure. So we're, gonna, we're going to evaluate the compound procedure. We're going to go in and evaluate the first part of that to get the, the whatever uh, procedure we're going to apply. We're going to find out that that's a defined uh, 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 a, a, a primitive procedure plus, it's deterministic, but it's a sampler, it just returns its, its arguments added together with probability one. Evaluate one, find out what that is, and evaluate this expression, which again is an ERP, okay, then we, then we apply Poisson to its argument, we generate a random variable, okay. Note that the parameter of interest here, so the reason why I've written it this way, okay, x is not POI2, but x two, or x12, rather, is the return value from Poisson 8, right? Okay, that's kind of important. So we're not actually doing inference about these. We're doing inference about the return values from these stochastic procedures, okay? So let's say that x12 takes value six, for instance, okay? So now we execute the next line of the program. Well, that actually doesn't do anything other than define a compound procedure, okay? So in fact, the next line of the program, we, okay, so we evaluate this, we evaluate this, we evaluate this. This just defines a compound procedure, so it doesn't do anything. It, gener it, evalu it defines the procedure, but it doesn't actually execute its internals, right? Same thing for the next line. We assume generative model part two is just this thunk, so it doesn't actually do anything. It doesn't evaluate anything in here. It just makes a procedure. The next time we do anything actually is down here. We're in interpreting this observe line. Okay. 
And we descend, so we evaluate what normal is, and we descend in, and, and we evaluate this expression, generative model part one, parameter of interest one, parameter of interest two. We evaluate that. We find out that this is a compound procedure, right? We bind the A to the, whatever the value of parameter one, parameter of interest one is. We bind B to whatever the value of parameter of interest two is, okay? What's the value of parameter of interest two? It's actually, okay, so who says six? Who says seven? Why are the sevens right? Plus one. Plus one. Okay, so that's actually kind of, kind of important, right? So I, I, I'll, let me stress that again, right? The randomness is, is in here, the value is here. They're two different things, okay? All right, all right. So, so we bind those, we, then we descend into, the, into this procedure and we start evaluating the body of this procedure, applying stochastic procedures and other procedures as we find them. So we, the first thing that we run into is a flip, okay? So what's the value of A? So I've, right, who says true? Who says 0.4? Why is 0.4 correct? Okay, so here, parameter of interest is actually exactly the value of x11. So parameter of interest is just the value of this thing. We said it was 0.4. Uh, A got bound to the value of parameter of interest 1. So, uh, so this thing is flip 0.4, okay? All right, so now the next bit of randomness that the program generates is the output value from that flip, okay? Let's say it took the value true, and that means that the next thing that gets evaluated is these, this little bit of internal randomness, right? So we're gonna draw from Poisson with parameter B, and again, the value of B is seven, right? Okay, all right. Writing these interpreters is uh, complicated, okay? Uh, then we, okay, so th then we're, we're okay. We've act then we've done everything that we need to do in this procedure. We've generated whatever value here. So let's say x14 is seven, okay? So uh, uh, now we have the return value for this. What's the return value for this? Right, the return value is 14 because if we drew randomness here uh, of seven, then we add seven to that and this returns, returns seven plus seven. Now we have a, an, an observed statement that we can, we, that we can evaluate, uh, which is a, a normally distributed quantity taking value 18 with mean fourteen and variance one, okay? This process repeats, okay? So we keep doing this, right? So we descend into this generative model part. So now we get to the second observe. So note, note that, the, that we've gone from x1 blah to x2 blah now. Okay, so now we're gonna generate, we're going to run the code necessary to evaluate the second observe statement, okay? And, and then we're able to, to at the, at the very end, we'll ha we have evaluated everything and we, can, and we can predict the value of Poisson 1, Poisson, uh, parameter of interest 1, parameter of interest 2, okay? Okay, so the, 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 what's the, the, the probability of this execution trace? Uh, so zero is an answer, which is kind of an interesting answer. What's the, um, <laughs> <laughs> What's the PDF of this execution trace? Uh, that's close. So that's so the, the one question, one answer is the product of the two observes. Any other? Any other? Uh, yes, there we go. Okay, so 
it's the product of all of this stuff on this side. Okay? So we have return values for every one of these. It's, a, it's the probability of 0.4 from beta 7, 4, the probability of 6 from Poisson 8, the probability of true from binomial 0.4, the probability of 7 from Poisson 7 times the probability of, of 18 from normal 14, so on and so forth. Okay? So what we've done is dynamically constructed a sequence of conditional distributions via the interpretation of a program that has stochastic elementary random procedures and stochastic compound procedures. Okay? Question. Yes. Here it comes. Okay, so the question is, uh, does this mean for all the things on the right-hand side, do you need to be able to sample from them? Yes. Do you need to be able to evaluate their mass or some sort of likelihood, something like that, of the output given the inputs? So the, the short answer to that is yes. The longer answer is in certain inference techniques, no. Okay. Um, so the... The fundamental requirement is that you're able to sample from them. The, the one that you absolutely must be able to point-wise evaluate is this one. That's, it will turn out that this is the only one, the observes are the only one that you have to actually be able to point-wise evaluate. Okay? And that's actually what Anglican uh, introduced to probabilistic programming. Okay. Okay? So that was a, an excellent, excellent question. Okay. okay. Now, what's the correspondence between probabilistic programming and sort of traditional statistical models, right? Like, what are, what, what, what are we doing here, right? So we can write, so I think the safest way to say this is that we can write programs that correspond to traditional generative statistical models, right, that always unfold in every possible execution path, no matter what the stochastic choices are that are made in the program, into the exact same sequence of conditional distributions as the traditional generative statistics model. So if you want to write a program that corresponds to an HMM, right? an HMM has a fixed structure sequence of conditional distributions that all have the same type and the same arguments and so on and so forth, right? You can write a program that, that, that corresponds to an HMM, no problem. But you can write programs that don't have obvious correspondences. So let's take a, a, a little, uh, just a quick example of what I mean by if we want to write an HMM, okay? So here's a three-state HMM. It's an easy piece of code to write, okay? So we assume that there's some, this is a finite, uh, HMM, where all we're doing in inference over is the, uh, is the latent state occupancy, not the parameters. Okay? So we have a, an initial state distribution, which is just uniform over three states. So it's a list of one third, one third, one third. We have a, a state transition distribution, which is a function given a state that returns a list conditioned uh, depending on the value of the state. So if you're in state zero, it returns a list of the next state probabilities. Okay, so this is the transition matrix. Um, we have a function that actually transitions the, 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 the HMM. So uh, transition is a function that takes the previous state and draws from a discrete distribution with parameters given by the, the state distribution, the, the state transition distribution for the previous state, which is looked up by this function, right? We have a function that builds dynamically a data structure called get state, which is a memoized procedure of the time index that, if it's at the beginning, draws from the initial state distribution. And uh, as you go along, transitions from the previous state by just actually figuring out what the previous state was. OK, so this is, I should point out, this is a, a beautiful example of, of a lazy construction for a data structure of the latent states in an HMM, okay? Worth taking a look at. And of course, there are observation means. Now, 
Okay, what happens here? Okay, so these are just, that's basically the full code for an HMM. There's, 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 you don't need any more than that. HMM is done, okay? You can write this and it will do inference for you. These work with relatively large, high dimensional uh, signals. Okay, so what happens is now we're gonna execute this observe statement and this is the first time all of these are just definitions. There's nothing that's actually been executed here. We're just defining, just defining procedures. So here when we, when we observe this normal distribution, the first thing it does is it calls get state, which goes up here, says, uh, have I called this with, uh, with parameter one before? No, so I have to actually run the body. So, uh, um, so I don't actually, it's, my index is greater than zero, so I need to transition. So I transition by getting the state at the previous time. So I actually recur back into get state, evaluate it for index zero. Index zero says I'm gonna, going to draw from the conditional distribution of the state, okay? All right, tricky. But what this does is this constructs in, by this one line draws from all of these distributions and waits by the observation, okay? All right, stare at that for a little while. Then the next line generates forward x2 given x1 and waits by y2 x2, okay? Next line, so on and so forth, okay? Now, we can look at this program and know with absolute certainty that there is no way that a sample path in this program, there are no, there are no execution traces that give rise to a different sequence of conditional distributions than this, okay? And in fact, you even know that the type of the distribution for x0 is discrete, and you know it's a parameter vector, and you know that the type of the distribution for x1 is discrete, and you know it's a parameter vector, although it's conditioned on the value of x0, and you know the type of the distribution for y1 given x1 because it's coded here, okay? But, since we're in this probabilistic programming context, we don't always know that this will be true. So how do you know that, 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 that there's, a, there's an exact correspondence between the sequence, you know, every single execution path of this program results in a sequence of conditional distributions that is exactly the same as an HMM. Uh, so the question is, is that because of memoization of the state? So, how, so, there's, so I'm trying to make a point about, um, about basically static analysis of programs and deciding exactly what, what paths the program could ever, possible take, ever possibly take. I think your question is about how the heck does this code actually work and what's going on? So the, 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 it, you know, why is, what's this mem doing here? How is it actually memo, how is it actually remembering the date, like which state the system is in, that sort of thing. Those are kind of two different questions. Am I getting you right or no? Yeah, probably what they Okay, yeah, so, uh, so I'll just say it. So uh, when confronted with a piece of arbitrary program text, it's not at all trivial to, to say that all possible execution paths result in the same fixed sequence of conditional distributions. We can write programs for which that's true. Specialized inference algorithms apply in these cases, right? Inference in the general case is harder because the type, number, dimension, so on and so forth of all of these conditional distributions can change depending on choices made during the execution of the program, okay? All right, so I'm just making a point about sort of the difficulty of inference and the fact that you, you, you have to do static programming anal program analysis, which is just as, just as hard as actually just running the program an infinite number of times, basically. Okay, so we can see that programs can be written that correspond to traditional generative statistics models that always unfold into a joint with the same number and types of elementary random procedures, but this is not true for general programs. Uh, the worst case uh, is that you, you can actually write a fully connected graphical model. In other words, you have a full joint parameterization because you can have every choice and every observation depend on all previous stochastic procedure applications the outcomes of them, right? Uh, and of course, 
the link functions between those can be complex, nonlinear, non-differentiable, non-invertible function, functional dependencies, right? Arbitrary pieces of code, okay? So, uh, actually, this is not a terrible breaking point. Uh, however, what I'm going to do is throw the exercises in front of you because they're related actually only up until what we're talking about right now, and they'll actually make it possible for you to sort of get what's going on in the latter part of this talk, which is sort of what I expected would happen. Um, so let me flip to the end here and suggest the following exercises. Okay, so again, I've spent a lot of time designing these exercises. Let me, let me, uh, and I'll be around in between, especially now that I haven't gone through all these slides. So uh, uh, I'll be around. We can, we can talk about these. Uh, try this one for sure. This one is easy. This is an, this, this one. If you, if you don't care about how probabilistic program uh, interpretation works, and you don't want to think hard about sort of the, what's going on mathematically, and you just want to think about how to write code and how to do modeling, then this is. This is a, an, another example of, of, it's just a coding example. Code uh, probabilistic matrix factorization. Uh, in the system, it's like three lines of code. We're not talking, it's not hard, okay? Conceptually, it takes a little bit, but it's, it's really not hard. Uh, and it's an example where actually inference doesn't do that well. And it's a, it, it's a, it's a thinking example about why that's hard as well. But you can use this as just a programming exercise to try programming probabilistic matrix factorization. Okay. Who's implemented probabilistic matrix factorization? Bayesian? Okay. All right. So there's some, this is a great opportunity. You can write a model, do inference in it that's non-trivial very, very quickly. So you learn something about that as well. Um, but if you want to think about what's going on in terms of inference, and sort of cover what I was talking about just now, you should, should look at this exercise. It's frankly fascinating, actually. So this is writing a procedure that generates random variables and then thinking about actually how, uh, how sampling in various, in, in, of various forms uh, works in that model. So I, I highly recommend you take a look at these two. You'll get a lot more out of the experience if you do. So how many have started the, the first uh, exercises, one and two? Awesome, sweet. How many have started this, the exercises three and four? Awesome. <laughs> and there's not a lot of time. I, for some reason, I had in my head that there's more time in between the two. Uh, I, I will try not to talk the entire time this time, but I will stay around. And we should, as much as you'd like to engage on the, in, uh, in this, uh, uh, <clears throat> I, will, I will engage with you. And you're starting to, get to, to answer some questions, which is great. Um, and we can always schedule extra time to, to play with things and to, and to learn together. That's the fun part. Um, I have he heard burbling around that not all of you are, are blessed with governments or parents or jobs that provide, well, there are a lot of max, but they're I'd say 85%, 80, 75% max. Those of you who are not running a, a Unix environment or, or specifically running a Windows environment, you may actually, since you aren't, don't have the scripts and the auto-installing stuff, you may actually have an old, even an old version of Anglican, even if you downloaded it yesterday. Um, so uh, if you're running Windows, make sure to get the very, very, very latest jar off of the website because there was a silly, silly issue with the, the one that was out there even yesterday. So if you've got a Mac, presumably you've been running, if you've run Anglican, you've seen that it's actually updated and asked you to download, it basically auto-downloaded auto a new, new version of Anglican. Anybody seen that? Okay, all right, a few people have done it. Okay, those who are running on a PC, PC, they don't get that. If you're running Unix, you should get it. But if you're running on a PC, you don't. And if, you, if you're running on a PC, go download the new version of the jar before you start playing with stuff too much. Otherwise, you're going to be in, in a world of hurt. OK. Has anybody uh, posted any bugs or issues to the Anglican repository? Everybody's aware that you can do so? and knows how to? Anybody paying attention to me at all? I see. OK. OK. All right, so let's, 
we set the stage for inference, okay? And some people came up and asked some, some excellent questions, so thank you for that. Uh, um, so, so we talked about, we got to static analysis and traditional generative models and how uh, some programs, if you write them in a nice way, sorry, I guess I have to stand really close now. Uh, um, if you write them such that they roll out to the same sequence of conditional distributions, they, they can correspond exactly to inference in, in, in known statistics models. Um, now we can start doing inference. I'll, I'll point this out that, the, that in, the original, in the original paper and in this little paper, The Principles and Practice of Probabilistic Programming, the easiest way to write inference is, is, is exactly what I said in the beginning. Uh, so if you have a generative model uh, that you can run, which is of course exactly what I just described a probabilistic programming being and showed you exactly how it, how it works, then you can sample in the space of probabilistic programming execution traces de facto by running them and checking the output of running the program against your observations, imposing an equality constraint, uh, and, and that's it. So you can actually see exactly what's going on here. So rejection query in, uh, for, for, uh, for probabilistic programs was the, is, is a, an, an inference mechanism. It was the inference mechanism uh, originally fronted in church. There were some others, but this is primarily what they used. So rejection query takes some procedure which basically generates your data and some condition which checks some condition, usually equality with respect to the data, but not necessarily. It evaluates that procedure, checks the condition. If that condition is an equality with respect to data, then it just returns the the, the evaluation of that, of that, of that thunk, i.e. the model. Uh, otherwise, it, it just recurs and, and, and does, does it all over again. So this is, rejection, this is a rejection sampling algorithm that does inference over the space of probabilistic program execution traces using all the tips and tricks that we, that we, that we talked about. But obviously, rejection sampling isn't going to work except in all, all but a very few cases. So. Uh, We've been looking for general purpose inference procedures for probabilistic programming systems for a while, and there are a couple. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the first of which is single site Markov Chain Monte Carlo, or in particular single site Metropolis Hastings, and I'm going to refer to that as random DB. So um, what we would what we'd like, as always, is to sample from the posterior distribution of execution traces uh, using, uh, so that's, that's what we would want. And what we're going to do is we're going to use the joint distribution. We're just going to plug in the values of the, of the observed quantities, OK? So we know that the conditional distribution of the, the latent variables in the program, given the observed data, is proportional to the joint where you fix the observations to the values that you have, OK? And if you, if you, if you define, define things this way, then we can think about doing Metropolis Hastings over the space of probabilistic program execution traces. Uh, and here we have the traditional Metropolis Hastings rule, where we, we know these terms, the, data, the probability of the data uh, conditioned on the execution trace. We know the prior on the execution trace, that's just running the program forward without respecting the observations. The question is, how do we transition from one execution trace to the next, given the, 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 the definition of the, uh, the joint distribution that I, that I gave you before? OK, so what we need is a proposal. What we have are the likelihoods. They're the observed statements. It's just the product of all of the observed expressions, right? And the prior is, is the sequence of all of the, the elementary random procedure returns. I should, I should point out that, say, for instance, the, the, the metacircular evaluator that I, that, I, that I showed you in one slide uh, needs to be modified in order to interpret probabilistic programs, and in particular needs to be modified such that the scores from elementary random procedure applications are kept around. In other words, you need to be able to, to have those procedures actually return not just the return value, but uh, the uh, interpreter needs to accumulate, usually log probability, the log probability of its outcome given, <coughs> given its arguments. Okay. Worth pointing out that now. And if you're actually going to implement such a system, you have to, this is, this is where, you, where you have to start paying attention. Okay, so. Um, 
any suggestions, any ideas about how one might go about building a proposal for, uh, for Metropolis Hastings algorithm that explores the, the space of probabilistic program execution traces? So we, we have that chain of probability distributions that we know it doesn't change across the run. So you can just go somewhere randomly in that chain and perturb the values. And then Okay, so I, so the question, the, the suggestion is part absolutely right and 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 just part a little bit a little bit off. So that says uh, and maybe I think it's it's more right than not. So so let's go back to where. Okay, so the 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 right part is well actually it's probably better to go back all the way to here, right? <laughs> so the right part is you've made a bunch of choices here, right? And you have all the return values. Why don't I just go pick one? change its value, right? So the only part that was a little bit squishy about your suggestion, which was you have the, f you said something like the fixed, and I don't know if you actually meant fixed, but you said you have this fixed set of, of choices and so on and so forth. Well, the problem is that if you go twiddle one of these values, so let's say we go in and we choose the x13 somehow. So we go in and we pick x13 and we're gonna go try to propose a new value for it. Well, the consequences of making that change may completely change the structure of this conditional distribution, right? Okay, so it's not, thick, it's not a fixed sequence of conditional distributions. What you can do is you can pick one of the return values, go try to modify its value, propose one, and then compute what the consequence is to the entire sequence of conditional distributions. How would you do that? Programs can be written, sorry, okay? But in general, this is not true, okay? Good point, okay. Any suggestions? Okay, so you've got this execution trace. You've made a bunch of random choices along the way. They map to parameter of, uh, parameters of interest and the predicts in sort of complicated ways. Pick, pick a value, what do we do? Engage. Um, how about you run the program up to that point, fiddle the value, and then run the program to its conclusion? Right? Okay. That generates a new, new sequence of conditional distributions. All the values are all plugged in. You can evaluate that number. Okay. Now you have a Metropolis Hastings ratio. You can accept or reject that new program execution trace. So I believe one of you, I think maybe you, somebody said uh, the other day, do you just run the program over and over and over and over again? Is that kind of what you do? Well, yes. In this, in this particular inference algorithm, that's basically what you do. You go in, you pick a random choice, okay? <clears throat> so let's, let's go find one, let's just pick one of the random choices made in the execution path of the program. Okay, let's call that um, X M J. So that would be the 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 Jth random choice made on the in between M minus one observe, observe M minus one and observe M. Okay, let's go modify the value of that that uh, random variable. Okay. So what's the probability of picking one of those random variables? Well, it's just the number of stochastic procedure applications in the original trace. You're just going to pick one uniformly at random. That's fine. Okay. Now we're going to propose uh, a new value for it from some function kappa. So this is going to be a function. We're going to talk about what that is. Right. Um, we need to uh, pay attention to the probability of whatever new value we generate given the execution trace prefix. So this notation is all of the random choices shared between the new prefix, new execution trace, and the old execution trace. So you can think about this as, as being something like, uh, where we have uh, x prime and x run along together, and then they hit this, this, this choice, which is x m j, okay? And they diverge. Right, and x x m j prime is this way, and x m j is this way, okay, and then something happens. And sometimes these things can come together, actually. Okay, they can they can they can rejoin, but uh, there's a branch, and we're going to evaluate what happens on either side of the branch. So we have to pay attention to the probability of this new value of generating this new value, 
given the execution trace prefix. So this is going to be x, the, the set of random variables here is the same. Right? Before you make a change, you know that the set of random variables is, that, you've, that you've drawn is the same. Uh, and we have to compute the probability of the new part of the proposed execution trace. So the new part of the proposed execution trace is here. Okay, that makes sense? You run the program, make a change, execute the program forward, prefix, suffix, okay? Okay, so that's the proposal to change one execution trace to another, okay? If you plug that into the acceptance ratio and you make the choice, and this is not the best thing that you could do, but if you make the choice, well, it's complicated to do it any other way actually, but uh, if, you, <clears throat> if you make the choice that the single site update is just to sample from the prior, i.e. to run the program forward, in other words, you have all the random choices you've made up to here, which means that this is a, a straight line execution path for the program. There is no randomness here anymore. You just have values for everything, right? So that means you can draw from, because you have the, the you can compute the type and parameters of whatever ERP you're about to draw from next. You can draw from that, and that's exactly what we'll use for kappa. We're just gonna actually propose again from the same distribution with the same parameters as before, but you might get a different value out. If you choose that, then the Metropolis-Hastings ratio simplifies to, to exactly this, okay? So um, we have the likelihood of the data given the new trace, the prior probability of the uh, complete new trace, the number of stochastic procedure applications in the original trace, the probability of regenerating the current trace continuation giving, given the proposal trace beginning, right? And then the opposite. So we have the likelihood given the old trace, the, the prior probability of the old trace, the number of stochastic, so this is basically Q on this side, the number of stochastic procedure applications in the new trace and the probability of generating a proposal trace continuation given the, the current trace beginning, okay? So this basically, if we flip all the way back again, will give you two different sequences, product sequences of conditional distributions and the return values, okay? Plus some, norm, some, some, some Hastings ratio stuff to, to compute as well. And now we can explore via Markov chain Monte Carlo, but by, via Metropolis Hastings, the space of probabilistic program execution traces, okay? And this is exactly what uh, first came out in, in what the paper lightweight implementations of probabilistic programming languages via transformational computation, okay? Um, and I call it random database. Okay, so just to, to, to hone in on this and be really concrete, here's the same program, and let's, let's indeed say that we are interested in, and in we pick one of the, the ERP draws at random. Let's say we go in and we pick flip A. So this happens somewhere in the program. I've totally skipped over addressing and how you actually go find these, pro these variables and exactly how to distinguish where they are. So this notation is deficient and a, a full notation would be uh, uh, absurdly complicated. Uh, but let's say we go in and we, we identify that somewhere in, in, at this execution address, okay? So this execution address really is um, this line, this procedure call on this line, this recursion depth, this so on and so forth. So you have to address this, this random variable very, very carefully, not just mj or ij or whatever. So you go in and you change this particular, uh, particular uh, the, the outcome of this particular flip. Say for instance, we propose false from the prior, okay? Now what happens? Well, if we propose false, now there was a, 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 a nice complimentary comment, which is that 
We need to, it's not bad to expose some of the dirtiness and like, and, and how hard some of this is, right? It's, we're trying to do inference over a very, very, very complicated, very large space. So what happens if we propose false here? Okay. Well, it actually completely invalidates this part of the original execution trace, right? If you think about it, uh, the, the type of the subsequent, the next random procedure application is going to change. It's going to change from Poisson to normal, right? The return value will be completely different, so on and so forth. And in the worst case, actually, it will in invalidate the entire uh, future execution path of the program, okay? So you can, there are ways to shortcut, you can absorb, there are smart things that you can do, but um, this is the basic idea. Everybody get it? Everybody get it? Right. So coding this is not necessarily the easiest thing in the world to do because, of course, you have to write an interpreter. The interpreter has to actually pay attention to all elementary random procedures. Those elementary random procedures would generate log, log, log likelihoods. You go in and you get some sort of addressing scheme put together. You go pick random variables. You, you propose new values for them. You, as efficiently and intelligently as you can, um, uh, 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 compute the 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 knock-on consequences of changing their 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 value, and you, then you compute the Metropolis Hastings ratio, and you and you sample over over traces. Um, a an in and out burger style um, uh, uh, feature of of Anglican. I don't think it's actually documented on the command line. If you type Anglican help, does it actually tell you that you can run RandomDB or no? It's hidden, okay? So it's a little hidden feature. Just for you guys, um, if when you're running Anglican with whatever source file or whatever, if you, if you use the additional command line flag minus m rdb, you'll run random db rather than the default, which is particle mcmc, which is coming up next, okay? So where did I come in? Well, uh, so I came in to the picture thinking about sequential Monte Carlo for probabilistic programming inference. Now, uh, there, there have been other people that have thought about this, uh, people in the programming languages community. Um, uh, but in terms of these, these Turing complete uh, probabilistic programming languages, uh, this, was, this was sort of a, a nice little idea. And it comes down to the fact that, in fact, all you need to be able to do is, is sample from the, uh, the forward execution of the program. Okay, so we talked about, uh, I put sequential Monte Carlo in front of you just very quickly. It approximates a target density with a set of realized traces. So, so uh, here, um, a sample or a particle or a trace is going to be a sequence of interpreter memory states, okay? And what we're after is the conditional, again, the conditional distribution of the, the interpreter memory states given all the observations. But now we're going to approximate this using a weighted set of particles where we propagate the particles in such a way that their approximate draws from this posterior distribution. Okay. So the way I've notated the probabilistic programming problem is... Uh, in a way that should be very suggestive of, of state space models, okay? It depends on your conceptualization of state space models. If you're okay with the dimension of the latent state growing, then, 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 then probabilistic programming is a state space model, or it can be phrased as a state space model. So the sequence of interpreter memory states <coughs> up to and including the nth observation, re recursively decomposes into the product of the uh, observe, uh, the, of pro the pro product of, pro of the, uh, the product of observing y n, given it the interpreter memory state up to n, x1 to n, the probability of transitioning from the interpreter memory state at n minus 1 to n times the prior distribution over interpreter memory states up to the n minus 1th observation, okay? 
And this really straightforwardly suggests sequential importance resampling or particle filtering as an inference mechanism for probabilistic programming. So in that particular case, remember, we ha have an importance ratio, which is going to be the distribution of interest and a proposal distribution. If we make the proposal distribution simply ignorant of the observation, and it just simply runs the program forward until the next observed directive, starting from whatever interpreter memory state you had before, then the importance weight in a sequential importance resampling algorithm is simply the, weight, is simply the observation likelihood. Okay? All right? So this is a little bit strange. So I also I talked about inference in a, in, in a state space model, right, where you have some sort of fixed parameter, and you have the latent state trajectory, and you have some observations, right? And how does, like, so we were talking about HMMs with fixed parameters, or uh, we'll get to Chinese restaurant process, or uh, Dirichlet process mixtures with, with fixed parameters and these sorts of things. So where, where do the parameter, like fixed parameters come in? Well, the program generates them. So it's a state space model, but there is no fixed parameter theta. You're always, ge you generate that in the program itself, okay? So the graphical model looks a little bit wonky in some sense, which is that um, you can either eagerly generate parameters straight away at the beginning of the program. So x11, for instance, are all of the, rent and, and up to x, x12, right? Those are all of the, random choices made before the first observation. So if you in initialize a bunch of parameters at the very beginning of the program, um, these are eager parameter initializations, but they're generated by the program. So the fixed parameters upon which everything else depends are actually generated by the program and they're generated up front. Then you do whatever is necessary to get your observations and you may lazily generate fixed parameters as well, okay? Okay, so the state here in this thing is the interpreter memory state. We're going to evolve the interpreter memory state. So this would be x1 at this point, and this would be x2 at this point, and this would be x3 here, x1 to 3, and this would be xn here. The transition from here to here to here, these little individual arrows are all the stochastic procedure applications. And, but the reality is, is that because these are all just sampling operations, all we need to do are indexed by the observes, right? You can think of this as just one big procedure for evolving the, the state of the interpreter uh, forward. Okay, F, as it were. Okay. The nice thing about sequential Monte Carlo, that code is, I think, probably completely unreadable from the back, so I'll just, I'll just stick with the, uh, the, uh, the, the parallel sequential Monte Carlo program execution. So this, the nice thing about it is that you can, uh, you can actually uh, straightforwardly uh, represent this as a parallel program that you can actually compile and write in whatever language you want. So this is actually this is actually sequential Monte Carlo for probabilistic C, but the the same thing applies for for Anglican and uh, and any of the other languages like Venture that have uh, incremental inference like sequential Monte Carlo built in. So how does what's what's the actual algorithm? Okay, so let's look at it. So here we have parallel. Sequential Monte Carlo program execution. So we're going to index by observations n, right? And we're going to have l particles. And what are we going to do? We're going to run l copies of the program. Now this is slightly different than just running the program over and over and over again and making a single change. It's actually quite different than running it over and over and over. What we're going to do is we're going to run them until the first observation. Okay. Then we're going to check the weight. So we're going to compute a bunch of weights. Those are going to be the likelihoods of the observations given the program trace up till that point. Right? We compute the, the, the weights and we check an, an, an effective sample size uh, calculation. Um, <clears throat> if the effective sample size is large enough, we just continue the program execution. <laughs> it's really simple. Got a bunch of programs running in parallel. They hit and observe. They compute the, the, the likelihood of the observation, the effective sample size, i.e. the weight distribution isn't so bad, they run the programs forward, they hit another observe, they compute, the, they compute an updated weight, so on and so forth, okay? So we've got a L copies of the program going at once. If the effective sample size gets too low, like in a, a traditional uh, particle filter, 
then um, you uh, uh, select for each of the running instances of the program how many times to fork, which can be zero. Okay. So in other words, what, is fork, what, I, what do I mean by fork here? I mean, you have these L copies of the program. What you would like is, if weights become skewed, uh, that what you would like to do is take the high weights and replicate that, that, those paths, replicate that suffix many times, uh, spawning many, many children, right? Like the, this is particle resampling. And what, what we're doing here is the fork operation basically branches the interpreter memory state as many times as, as is necessary given the resampling operation. Okay? Make sense? And you continue. And of course, because at the very end we have samples, we have a sample set that's, that are draws from the conditional distribution of all of the random choices made in the program, given all of the observations, then we can just compute our predicts, whatever the predict statements are. Okay. So I should I should I should say mm, uh, first of all this is actually this actually is pretty easy okay there's none of this like keeping track of uh, you don't have to go in and do Metropolis Hastings you just run a, run your program in parallel you do have to you do have to synchronize here at a at a, at a barrier to to compute all of these uh, observation likelihoods but this generalizes inference over the entire space of probabilistic program programs yeah. Pretty cool. And obviously opens up the path to scalability, right? L can be very, very large on modern modern architectures. Yeah. Question. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, just uh, right. So in, in the end you want samples that are drawn with a probability corresponding to the criteria. Um, is this achieved by that branching? So is because Okay, good question. So what, what's happening here? So uh, uh, do you know sequential importance resampling? You're okay with particle filtering? Iffy, okay. Um, where, where is the posterior estimate coming from here? So this is a, it's a particle filter, okay? So uh, if, you ignore the, 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 the res, if you ignore the resample bit here, this effective sample size thing, what's happening is you're running um, what's happening is you're running L copies of the program forward, okay? And let's say that you don't do any resampling, okay? Probably not a good idea, but you, you, you could do so. What you're going to end up doing is that every observation, right, so this is going to be y1, and this is going to be y2, and so on and so forth, y3. You're computing a weight. Okay? <clears throat> so the weight of this one might be, you know, uh, they're unnormalized, so it might be 7, and this one might be 0.1, and this one might be 23, and so on and so forth, right? And that's basically a score of how well the program execution trace, all the random choices up to that point, match the observed data. Okay? All right? And you continue this process, and you, and basically your your the weight of an execution trace accumulates as you observe more and more <coughs> quantities. Okay, so you're going to get another observation here, uh, you know, 14. And you're going to get a, another weight here. You're going to get another weight here, so on and so forth for uh, uh, one, whatever, uh, 0 0.05, blah blah blah. Okay. The resample part, okay, so once you get here, then you get a weighted set of samples, right? But chances are mm, that's not going to be p particularly pretty, right? Basically, it's like basically what you've done is you've run the entire, if you do that with no resampling, you've run the entire program forward, and basically you've used the, pr the, 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 the program as the entire program is the proposal, 
in, a, in an important sampling algorithm, and all of the weights as the, as, so if you have P of xy over Q of xy, in this, in what you've just done is you've basically, uh, you've, is you've, uh, uh, if you choose P, Q of x to be P of x, what you've done is you've basically run the program forward and computed a weight for that, that important sample using all the observations at once. Okay? So in that particular case, you know that the, that the proposal distribution is very, very unlikely to be well matched to the, 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 the distribution of interest, so that's going to be incredibly inefficient. So, so, uh, so sequential importance resampling says, okay, so let's run along, right? And if we have skewed weights here, well, why are we bothering with this one? Like intuitively speaking, like what's the, what's the point of keeping that one around? And the maths work out, right? But basically you can say, all right, let's, now let's resample from this set. We normalize these weights and resample. And let's say this one gets resampled a bunch of times. This one dies, this one dies, and this one gets sampled once, okay? All right? And you can, you can show pretty straightforwardly that if you do this, you, you know, you, it, everything works just fine. So it's basically a way to avoid um, throwing away data quantity. It's a more efficient sampler. Okay? So basically it says, it says if you have, a good, if you have a, a good run to this point, chances are it's probably going to be better than, than a bad run to this point going forward in, an, in a very, very intuitive sense. Okay? Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, when any weird like you have a sample, you hold it with a strong. Okay, so somebody knows, somebody knows sequential importance resampling slash particle filtering says when n is large, you're going to have a sample impoverishment problem, which basically means effectively that when n is large, you're going to have some sort of tree that, that looks like this with. Very, very high probability, right? So in other words, one execution path here and some at the end. Yeah? Yes. Um, it's coming. It's coming. So the, so the question is, do, do, we, do we deal with this sample impoverishment problem, i.e. the fact that, that uh, uh, all of the execution paths in, an, in a sequential Monte Carlo algorithm for inference are likely to share the same prefix. Uh, the, 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 the that's, a, that's a problem with sequential Monte Carlo, right? Uh, the fact that you can do sequential Monte Carlo for probabilistic programming inference is the, is the point here. We can do more advanced things, which still suffer from this to a certain extent, but less so. Okay, so everybody get sequential Monte Carlo for, so just, just to throw this out there, if you're going to write one of these interpreters sometime, I think, I think the all, was it, Twan did it in three and a half hours, is that right? I think so. So we, I, I, I made five, well, I made it, I'm, okay, I made, I made a challenge in my group and it said, uh, you know, I, I think you should be able to implement one of these interpreters now in five hours or fewer. And there was a guy visiting the lab who was a major Haskell hacker who wrote an interpreter using these, these techniques uh, and commented the number of hours required in the code, and it took him three and a half hours to complete it. Okay? So I think one of, the, one of the major contributions here is actually sort of elucidating what's going on. Right? So in other words, if you were to read some of the original papers, on probabilistic programming, you would have a very difficult time implementing a, an interpreter. But here it's relatively straightforward, and this is really straightforward, right? Run the program, check the observes, okay? Uh, is it the most efficient inference? Not necessarily. But if, you're, if you run on 1,000 EC2 instances and run 1,000 particles each, and L is really, really large, and N is not so, not, not so large, you can do inference in some pretty interesting models. Yeah? Okay, so, all right, but SMC we know, for those of us who know SMC, we know that a single passive SMC 
isn't, isn't going to do particularly well right, because of this, this sample degeneracy problem. But I mentioned particle, uh, particle marginal metropolis hastings. Now we'll, I'll talk about particle independent metropolis hastings. Independent metropolis hastings, which is, again, a, a very straightforward algorithm that allows you to run, essentially, at an intuitive level, it allows you to run sequential Mar Monte Carlo over and over and over again. Okay? Uh, which deals with the sample degeneracy problem a little bit by actually just getting to rerun sequential Monte Carlo over again. Who knows uh, PIMH? All right. Okay. All right. So what do you do? You run sequential Monte Carlo, okay? And using the weights that you calculated here, um, uh, <clears throat> you can compute uh, an estimate of the uh, evidence of the data. Okay, so there's no fixed parameter here, that's why it's PIMH, right? So you can e compute an estimate of the evidence, right? And the algorithm for PIMH, PIMH for probabilistic programming inference is quite, quite simple. Um, run SMC once, compute this estimate, rerun SMC, the exact same algorithm, exactly this algorithm, rerun SMC, compute a new marginal likelihood estimate, and compute, and then accept the new particle set with probability equal to the ratio. Okay. This is a Metropolis Hastings with a uh, sequential Monte Carlo proposal. Okay. Valid algorithm. Uh, it shows up in the PMCMC uh, paper. Okay. Pretty sweet. Okay. So what is, the, what is the net effect of it? Uh, it means that basically instead of running the program just once, and getting some sort of estimate. You can just run it again and again and again, but L times in parallel, right? Randomly, but asymptotically, all of the predict averages from all the particles that are emitted by this algorithm converge to their proper posterior expectations over the entire family of models that can be represented as probabilistic programs. Okay? I think so, a, a, a growing fraction of you is starting to think, wait a second, actually, this is kind of cool. Yeah, a growing fraction. Still small, but we'll get there. <coughs> okay, last little algorithm uh, is uh, Particle Gibbs. So Particle Gibbs is a PMCMC variant. Who knows Particle Gibbs? Probably the same two guys, I'm guessing. Particle Gibbs? Uh, okay, all right. I recommend that you take a look at uh, the, the, the paper that actually defines particle Gibbs itself and, 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 and this paper which explains how to do it for, prob for probabilistic programming inference. So particle Gibbs is another SMC within MH algorithm, um, it, except that it's a Gibbs algorithm because it's a Metropolis Hastings, al a Metropolis Hastings algorithm whose acceptance probability is always one, okay? So, uh, and I, it's, I won't go too far into the details, I'll, I'll give you the algorithmic description of this, but it's, uh, you run sequential Monte Carlo as before, but then on subsequent iterations you run a specialized version of sequential Monte Carlo where you keep around uh, a, an interpreter, a set of interpreter memory states, a sequence of interpreter memory states which we'll call the retained particle. Okay? And because it's SMC and because you have this retained particle, it's non-local, uh, you can, you can, it changes many variables at once, um, uh, and it hill climbs very, very effectively in a very large uh, variety of problems. Okay, so this is the, the algorithm block in this, uh, in this paper entitled A New Approach to Probabilistic Programming Inference that appeared at this AI stats that introduces uh, uh, particle Gibbs but particle MCMC in general uh, for probabilistic program inference. Uh, it's worth going through this. I know it's, it looks horrible, but um, it's actually pretty straightforward and pretty easy to implement, okay? So again, we have L particles. Now we're gonna run for some number of sweeps. S is in on the, command, <laughs> command line, uh, on the Anglican command line argument. Uh, actually, that's not true. I take that back. That's totally not even remotely true. Um, uh, if you don't specify a number of, of samples, then the sweeps will just run to infinity. That's true. Okay, so you initialize this, this, this algorithm for probabilistic programming inference by running sequential Monte Carlo. That generates a weighted set of 
sequences of interpreter memory states. Okay. Then, on all subsequent iterations of the algorithm, we pick one of those. Okay, so this little R stands for sample or uh, resample from the set of interpreter memory sequence, the set of sequences of interpreter memory states, and and we're going to sample uniform uh, uniformly from them, and that's going to give us a retained particle. That's this x star one to n. So this is a again a sequence of interpreter memory states, uh, but it's a it's a good one. Okay, that'll make sense in a little bit. Then for the some order of the lines of the program. We're going to, for all but the retained particle, fork the interpreter memory state. Okay. Uh, okay. Then, depending on what kind of directive we hit, whether it's an assume, a predict, or an observe. If it's an assume, then in that fresh forked copy of the interpreter memory state, we just interpret the line of code. Do whatever metacircular evaluation is necessary in order to actually evaluate that line of code. Uh, then we take those updated states, updated interpreter memory states, and we just build a data structure, making sure to keep around the retained particle. Okay, so basically we do we advance the L minus one interpreters, and we already have we already have executed that line of program that line of code in the retained particle because it's a sequence of interpreter memory states and we've already run that program so we've actually got the entire run sitting around. So we take that and <coughs> um, we just shove it into this data structure. Okay? If it's a predict, it's really easy, right? For, uh, for basically all of the particles in our, in our set, all of the interpreter memory states, we just inter interpret that line of the code straight away and that will emit some output. If the directive is an observe, the simplest thing, this has no resampling, it has none of the stuff that it ha had before, the simplest thing that we can do is for everything except for the retained particle, we interpret that line of code in those interpreters. Okay, so for L minus one copies of the program, we just run the observe statement, okay? Running that observe statement outputs a log probability, right? It gives you the log probability of the observation, no? That's the weight here, okay? Uh, and of course, the updated interpreter memory state because there might have been randomness on the observed line, right? And then what we do is we just do, a, we do the valid here, and this is related to the mathematics of particle MCMC, that we do the valid resampling, a valid resampling that resamples L minus one interpreter memory states from all of those that were just run and the retained particle up to that point, up to that observation. And then after we resample L minus one of them, we stick the retained particle back in again. So you're certain that your set of L particles always has the retained particle in it, always, period. Okay? So basically this is a resampling that, that's conditioned on the fact that the, that the retained particle is reinserted into the set of particles up to step in every single time. So schematically, what does this look like? So here's uh, L copies of the program, okay? So we're going to run forward, okay? And don't worry about the colors for the moment. Basically, you can think about this is the sequential Monte Carlo pass, right? So we're going to execute statements in the program, we're gonna execute statements in the program, and occasionally we'll get to a point where where there's a skew in the weights, so the first time there's a skew in the weights is right here, and in fact, this one is preferentially downsampled, right? And this one is branched twice, right? Uh, this one, this is the next time there's a, the, the effective sample size is small, so we, we branch this one twice and discontinue this one, okay? And we run forward in this way, this one, this one gets, uh, gets branched twice, so on and so forth. And this is the, the particle trajectories, the, the evolution of the sequence of interpreter memory states as you execute the program. Everybody get that? Questions, there must be questions at this point. Or everybody's just doing the exercises or checking Facebook. <laughs> As we've drawn it so far, this is the first sweep. Okay? Now we pay attention to the colors. Okay? So let's at the very end say, okay, so now we've got a set of 
<clears throat> either a weighted or unweighted, depending on whether you do the last resample or not, you have a, uh, a set of particles, a set of sequences of interpreter memory states, yeah, uh, from which we're going to pick one. Okay, so if we pick according to the weights, we'll pick the retained particle. Okay, let's say it's the red one. Okay. Now, the red one, we have the, what we have. We, this is a little bit strange if you think about what the data structure is, right? It really is a, basically a linked list. Think about it that way. That's not how we actually do it, but a linked list of interpreter memory states, right? Here's the entire state of a Turing machine. We perform, we interpret one line of code. There's the, the, the consequent of interpreting that line of code, but we have a link from here to here. There's actually like the interpreter memory state. We have the entire memory of the computer here, and then here, and then here, and then here, and then here, okay? All right, so that's what the sequence is, right? And we actually keep one of those around, okay? That's the retained particle, okay? So we pick one, and we keep one of those data structures around, all right? Uh, and then we run L minus one of them. Okay. But now we're doing the, the PMCMC sweep, right? Sorry to change the color there. Um, we're doing the PMCMC sweep, which means that we, ne we don't ever actually have to recompute any of these state transitions. We have them, right? And in fact, whenever we resample, we cannot ever kill this particle off. It always exists, okay? So why is this a, why is this a good thing? besides the fact that it's a valid Metropolis-Hastings algorithm that has sequential Monte Carlo as its, as, it, as its proposal mechanism and always accepts with probability one and has a very, very nice convergence properties. Intuitively, the reason why it's a very nice thing is that once the program, so let's, let's think about what's gonna happen here. So you're gonna run the program, you're gonna do sequential Monte Carlo, basically, and you're gonna get a crap estimate. Basically, none of the program execution traces are actually gonna be any good. Right? The prior is probably not well matched to the posterior, so things aren't going to be that pretty. But there'll be one or two or some subset of the execution traces that are a little better than the rest. Okay? So it's kind of a, a, a survival of the fittest kind of thing. Right? So chances are those good execution traces will be preferentially, ex will be preferentially selected in the last sampling like in, 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 this, in this sampling step. So now you're gonna get at least one good execution trace in this set, right? So the retained particle is probably gonna be one of the good execution traces. It doesn't have to be, you have to have ergodicity, right? But, but if you think about it as hill climbing or stochastic gradient descent or whatever, then you have an execution trace that's actually pretty decent, right? And every subsequent pass says, okay, well, we'll try a bunch of stuff in the beginning. Maybe we can find a better, better, better beginning to the program. But actually, maybe if, if we find out that all of, we've, we've tried a bunch of beginnings that are crap, actually compared to the retained particle as it evolves into the future, then it's always there. It's always in the set. So basically, basically you, you kind of can really only improve on what the retained particle maintains. That make sense? Intuitively, at least, yeah. <laughs> Good question. Uh, so the question is, can you retain two particles? Uh, uh, go ask Arno. Is the is the Arno just say that's the that's the answer I'm going to give to that? Not trivially. Um, any other question? Yeah. So, would it? When you're far away from goods, um, posterior, mm -hmm. would it be pretty similar to some sort of climbing? And so, what, I mean, I guess what you want is when you're, when you're bad, you're climbing quickly. And then when you're good, you actually want, as you can see, you actually want <coughs> to walk around the space. So, can I think of it like that? That, that? that when I'm trying to burn in, I'm really in optimization for climbing mode. When I've got there, I mean, <coughs> Is there anything the algorithm that kind of Okay. Uh, I don't know how to summarize what you what, what you said so that everybody can hear what, what you said, but I'll I'll try to, to just give an answer that, that everybody will will sort of appreciate. Um, uh, this this is not there's this is not a a a, a, a magic 
bullet super, we haven't solved inference, right? Inference is still hard, right? And high dimensional space is still very hard. Really what we're looking at is, is the difference between doing, okay, so what do we have? We basically, in the, in, for general purpose inference over the, the entire family of probabilistic programs, we have uh, rejection sampling, Metropolis Hastings, single site Metropolis Hastings, and now this. Okay. Combinations of them, so on and so forth. So the question is, if you're way out, you're, I mean, it's, a standard, it's the standard MCMC question, right? So if you're way out in the, in the, in the tails in your proposal, right, what's really going to happen, right? So uh, the, the experience so far, and we have lots of empirical evidence for this, suggests that because of the properties of PMCMC, even though the space of probabilistic programs actually violates most of the theoretical assumptions that they make about how quickly it converges under certain circumstances, we find that it, it does walk, it both hill climbs more effectively and actually explores more effectively as well. Okay? And so that's kind of why the, the, the real action of why is, I think, has, has, a, has a number of, number of reasons, but uh, one, of the, one of the characteristics of PMCMC is, of course, that it's non-local. Right? So in other words, you actually do have a chance of changing all of your variables at once. In other words, when you generate a new execution path, it's possible that you know, a completely distinct one from your retained particle will actually dominate, okay? which means that you can actually just, you can, you can jump massive distances in the, in the space in, in one fell swoop rather than modifying an individual variable. So this is, this is an example of, uh, of that, this is a visualization of that. So what's going on here? So this is the HMM code that I showed before. So this is not, this is, this is actually a probabilistic program inference. So it's this, it's this code, okay? So the, the question is, uh, the question is, What's the, the marginal distribution over these states given, given these observations? Okay, so we're going to do PMCMC probabilistic program inference, and we're going to do random DB probabilistic programming inference in this program to, to infer these latent states. And what you'll see, not surprisingly, right, is that the action of the single site Metropolis Hastings algorithm is to go and modify a single one of those latent variables. Now, that's, of course, what you're looking at is, of course, the inference over the randomness, and you're seeing a projection of, the infer of, of, the, of what's going on in the inference algorithm, right? We're doing inference over the execution traces, but we can look at what, what it looks like if we actually just look at the sampled values for the latent, latent trajectories, and then, of course, the sample averages that are computed as, as we're running along. And single site is single site. It's changing one variable at a time, but that's what you can do. PMCMC will consider completely brand new, so this is one sweep at a time, right? One sample at a time. It will have, you know, it will transition from one, it will transition by changing many, many variables at the same time, potentially, right? And it converges much more rapidly as a result, right? Yeah? What we're showing in the top right is that the retained part um, Actually, so uh, it's, it's, you it's a little bit non-trivial and we need to actually write this up, but you can actually use all of the particles emitted by PMCMC and compute averages with respect to that. So this is a figure of all of the particles that are coming out, not just the retained particle. Okay? So it's, a, it's an apples to apples comparison. Basically, it's, it's effectively a simulation, a simulation, a simulation, although the PMCMC one runs L or L minus one at the same time. But what this is visualizing is the difference from one <coughs> particle to the next. So every frame of this is what happens when you compute an expectation using each particle and using each sweep from random GB. Does that make sense? Roughly? Good question. Okay. Um, moreover, uh, what we what we found is, and this, this has to do with PMCMC, but it's it, the the contribution is that you can do this in the in the space of probabilistic programming languages, right? What we found it, for 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 a relatively large number of models, uh, although we there's more experimentation to be done for sure there, is that 
if you do very, very careful and very fair comparisons um, uh, between uh, single site Metropolis Hastings or RandomDB and particle MCMC, what you get is actually, even in terms of the, the, the amount of energy that the computer uses to solve the inference problem, this is a, a more efficient uh, a approach, okay? So what do I mean by that? So, so here's a Kale divergence between the marginal posterior distribution of the state occupancies for this HMM. This is just one of the models. I'm not gonna bore you with all of them. Uh, uh, here's the ground truth computed by forward backward. Here's the, the result from PMCMC. Here's the result from RandomDB. They both converge, but they converge, they converge at the same rate, but, but they, there's a, this, this, this offset, which is kind of, kind of interesting. And what we're counting here are the number of function or procedure applications performed by the interpreter, okay? This actually is, and this is, this is across all particles, this is across all, you know, this is the amount of computation, the actual, you, we could relabel this joules if we wanted to, right? It's the amount of computation the machine does in order to arrive at a, at a, at a solution of a particular, uh, um, at a, of a particular fidelity. And we see this for a, a large variety of models. Now, I should point out one sobering thing. So what we've done is, you know, do I care about little HMM problems like this? No, I care about the arithmetic expression, procedure, inference about procedure, AI kinds of uses of these languages. We prove them out by making sure that they converge on these small and relatively, frankly, uninteresting problems where you can run off-the-shelf inference algorithms. Okay, fine. One of the goals of the probabilistic community, programming community is to automate inference to such an extent that um, uh, basically uh, you get the same performance as a hand-built custom inference algorithm. So it's kind of interesting to look here at, uh, in, in the HMM, of course, you, we all know that you can run forward-backward to get the, the marginal, this is how you get the marginal distri the distribution over state occupancy in an HMM, right? You just run forward-backward. We can actually write forward, backward in Anglican, or any of these any of these languages, and do the same thing. Count how many how much energy it takes to compute that marginal distribution. If you give up the the generality of the probabilistic programming language, and and are comfortable actually only doing inference in a, a you know a, a fixed dimension hidden Markov model, this red line is the number of procedure applications necessary to compute forward backward. So this is a little bit sobering, right? So it suggests that there's, there's plenty of room to move all of this stuff over to the red line. Okay, so in other words, you run forward backward, it takes that number of procedure applications in order to compute this marginal distribution. If you use these sampling techniques, if what you really care about is estimating this and you really care about estimating an HMM, and then these take a substantial amount more energy to arrive at, uh, at, uh, uh, at, at, at good solutions. Make sense? Okay. So don't take this as a, as, a, as a negative finding, right? It's not terribly surprising that forward backward does well on it for an HMM, right? Uh, it, you, you cannot run forward backward in all of the, 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 the models that we can, we can deal with with probabilistic programming systems. Okay, so uh, there is, a, there is a, an opportunity that I, I'd like to point out here, which is that um, there's a, there are some, there's some uh, inference optimizations that are sort of non-obvious non and non-trivial, uh, but show up using this sort of new approach to probabilistic programming inference, which is one of which is just merely reordering the lines of the program. So I haven't talked about this or stressed, it, stressed about it at all. But the lines of the program are actually exchangeable. You can basically write them in, write, write them in, they're partially exchangeable. You can write them in any order up to variable scoping and syntactic rules. In other words, you have to actually have declared variables that you're gonna use later. But besides that, you can reorder the observations as, as much as you want and, and if, you know, it's fine, okay? Uh, everything works out. Uh, so if you want, you can permute the lines of your program up to syntactic constraints and see what happens to inference. And it turns out that, of course, not terribly surprisingly, inference uh, uh, speed in terms of, say, for instance, here, simulations is affected by, by program line orderings. And it's really non-obvious, for instance, exactly what program line orderings are best. So, for instance, here we're working with, a, with an HMM, 
and the, the obvious line ordering. So this is the orange is random DB, the blues are, 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 are PMCMC, and uh, the sort of the line orderings here are ordered from the most obvious sequence that you would write the observation statements in for an HMM, i.e. observe the first one first, the second one first, so on and so forth, to the most antagonistic, okay? So if you write your program in the wrong order, inference is not gonna be fast. Some sense? For this particular <coughs> inference algorithm. Of course, random DB doesn't care what order the, the, the program lines are, uh, appear in, so you can reorder the, the program in any, any which way and it doesn't matter at all. Um, over here in the DP mixture, we thought we wrote the, uh, so there's a, we, there's a and if you look in the paper, there's a DP mixture modeling example. Um, we thought we write the, wrote the, the program with the lines in the correct order, but in fact, there's, there are uh, orderings that are much more efficient. Okay. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, a couple of people came up and talked about Bayes nets um, and constraints and how, how basically to operate with, with, with constraints rather than soft observations. So uh, another, just a little aside before I, I finish up with the inference part of this, uh, the, it's possible to use Dirac observations. In other words, it's, it's possible to impose directly constraints in, in Anglican, okay? So uh, you can use, this is a, an, an in and out feature. I think it's sitting here, maybe it's not. So if you want to impose a constraint, you can write a statement that looks like this, observe Dirac plus AB seven. So we did the arithmetic, exp we did the, the, the two numbers summed together equal something, right? And we did this funny thing with a normal distribution to give ourselves a little bit of slack, okay? You can write this, okay? So you can impose harsh constraints, right? Um, but it's worth pointing out that what you're doing when you do that, and the reason why Anglican doesn't expose this, and I shouldn't even probably actually give you the, the knowledge that you can do this in Anglican, is that um, just some food for thought, sequential Monte Carlo and particle MCMC both re reduce to rejection, in the case of PMCMC, repeated rejection sampling if all of the observations are expressed as constraints. Okay, and you can sort of see this by looking at the conditional distribution that we're interested in, the joint distribution, and if we express a constraint here, Instead of using observed values, and we actually constrain the output of the program to match the observed values, then what we get is essentially exactly the form of the rejection sampling algorithm that we showed that I, that I showed really, really early, er, early this morning, right? Where you just sample from the prior, and you check to see whether or not um, all of your observes are matched by the output of the program. Okay, so using constraints like this actually hurts your ability to do inference, okay? Um, we'll leave it at that. Okay, uh, so, um, yeah. So Churchill, a, a while ago, introduced the, this idea of generative, probabilistic, Turing-complete programming languages and, and posited itself as an interesting and, and powerful language for, for expressing models. And basically had inference that kind of didn't work. It was basically rejection sampling, although they tried lots of stuff. Um, but what actually came out was, was not terribly efficient. Okay. Um, recently, with Venture and Anglican and probabilistic JavaScript and the, and the kinds of inference that, that are exposed in each of those, RandomDB, um, uh, particle filtering, sequential Monte Carlo, PMCMC, mixed variants of them, um, we're getting closer to, to, to actually achieving this, this goal of automatic, automatic inference that actually works in a relatively large variety of models. Um, I should point out that, that, the, that actually intentionally in the, in the work that, that appeared at AI Stats and what's, what I've been talking about, 
PMCMC is really actually not optimized at all. So in other words, there's, there's, like, there's lots of stuff left on the table. There's lots of low-hanging fruit. We're sampling from the prior. We're doing multinomial resampling. We're not doing ancestral resampling. Um, and as a result, it still gets stuck sometimes. It doesn't mix always as well as it should. Eagerness really, really hurts if you establish all of your random variables right at the beginning of the program. Basically, all of the techniques um, uh, suffer. Um, but we're moving really, in, I think, in an interesting and a very fast pace towards, uh, towards this AI goal. So if you think about this as, as some, if you think about inference and probabilistic programming languages or using these, these tools like PMCMC or SMC or whatever as basically hill climbing over this really, really, really richly expressive set of models, then we're getting to the point where we can actually hill climb in a pretty, in a pretty serious way over a pretty serious set of models. Uh, and we can do things like uh, um, expression induction and inference about inference and inference about procedures and Bayesian neural nets. And we can do all this sort of stuff. And we can actually do it at not, it used to be at, at this scale. Now it's at this scale. And, and we have paths to actually really winning. Okay, um, so I suggested some exercises for in between. That's great. Uh, um, hopefully, you have an opportunity to get to these. Did I, did I actually only have until twelve thirty? Is that is that the plan? Awesome. So perfect. So I'll end this lecture here and then give you a couple of thoughts about Bayesian nonparametrics and uh, probabilistic programming in the last little bit remaining.